Hello, everyone, and welcome to how AMP Limited builds a cloud data lake it could trust. When you join today's webinar, you selected join either by phone call or your computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change that selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in the control panel. Uh, also from the same control panel, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions for the day, today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane. Uh, we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, if for some reason we're not able to address your question today, we plan to respond to each of those personally through email. Uh, the deck will be available through SlideShare along with a recording of the webinar two to three days after the conclusion of the presentation. So please keep an eye out for that via email. My name is Ryan Peterson. I'm the Global Technology Segment Lead for Data and Analytics at Amazon Web Services. I'll be your host and moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to take just a minute to introduce our speakers for today. So I'll be speaking uh, first to tell you a little bit about Amazon Web Services and what we bring to the table for this solution. Uh, followed by me will be Nick Piet, the Chief Evangelist for Talent. And then we'll have Karen Halligan, the Head of Information Management Center of Excellence for Technology and Operations at AMP Limited. Today's agenda is an overview of big data, data lakes, and analytics for financial services, uh, especially sitting on top of AWS. We'll be speaking about talent uh, from analytics to operations, what you need to do to make a big data lake successful. And then we'll hear from our customer, AMP Limited, about integrating data, verifying and fixing quality challenges, and improving reporting. Uh, we'll follow that by some Q&A and discussion. Uh, the learning goals for today are to integrate data from different sources, to refine data, to use it to inform business decisions. We'll talk about building an agile data lake on top of AWS. Uh, how to process big data at scale on AWS, leveraging Apache Spark on Elastic EMR. So financial institutions uh, obviously have a unique data protection challenges. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, the change in regulations with respect to GDPR, CCPA, uh, FSA, and DPA, and all the different payment process systems and more. Uh, obviously, we have this uh, global uh, industry uh, that's changing pretty rapidly with things like the open banking regime in various countries. Uh, we're learning a lot about uh, how that's going to take and impact things over time. Uh, financial privacy, obviously, with uh, things like PCI, but also with the advent of GDPR and CCPA, uh, we're seeing that really become a requirement in order to protect data at every level. Uh, and then obviously all of the layers of compliance and risk related to all the different various places that uh, the data can be, uh, could be breached if you're not careful, uh, requires really good uh, processes for handling data pipelines uh, through your organization. Our data lakes architecture looks at uh, S3 as the center of the data lake. Uh, S3 is one of the largest scalable architectures in the world with unlimited durability and availability, uh, 11, 11 nines of durability, I should say. Uh, surrounding that architecture is the ability to ingest information from all sorts of different uh, services and, and processes, whether that's unstructured data, structured data, or even streaming content. You can use solutions like Amazon Kinesis Firehose, uh, which takes streams and pushes it into the data lake. Uh, but we'll really spend a lot of time today talking about talent and how you can use talent to bring in pipeline data in from all these different sources into that data lake, as well as to prepare that data lake for other uh, places that might exist, such as Amazon Redshift. Uh, AWS, our customers have told us frequently about some of the reasons they like to use S3 specifically for their data lake. Uh, one of those is because of the 11 nines of durability and the distribution of data across the different environments. Others are because of the uh, extensive security and compliance regimes that we have to take care of. A uh, good example of that is, well, we may have to do something for financial services, but we also may have to do something for healthcare. So when you start thinking about all these different industries that we have to uh, make sure that all of the infrastructure is taken care of, there's a long list of the different compliance regimes that we are taking care of for that infrastructure. Uh, 
a newer capability within S3 is something called S3 Select that allows the ability to retrieve just portions of very large sets of data. So we reduce the cost and the time to uh, collect information from the S3 buckets. And so we've been able to speed up performance in a way that's uh, second to none. Uh, and we have a flexible uh, management platform uh, so we can we can use it for, uh, you, can, you can look at things like the consumption, uh, the cost and security of your entire environment, uh, how you automatically tier or grow uh, the environment all from one platform. This is uh, the most exciting thing our customers tell us about is that in the past, when they wanted to scale an architecture and grow potentially, for example, more uh, data capacity, or maybe they needed to grow performance capacity, uh, they would have to add a box, a server, and that would sometimes meet or not meet their needs. And so they may have to buy more servers when the demand would start to reduce, then they would run into challenges where they had too many servers and they were paying for all of that excess capacity, but they only had a lower demand. With AWS, because of elastic scalability, you can pay for what you need, and we keep that demand just under the requirements of your capacity, ensuring that you always have what you need uh, when you need it. Uh, one of the uh, examples of where you can, you can save a lot of money is using something called EC2 spot instances. And spot instances are basically excess instances that we have available uh, that we put out for a lower price point to make it so that people can use all of that excess capacity uh, to process large capacities of data. Uh, storing enough data is uh, not enough. If you start putting everything, we've been saying this for the last 10 years or so, dump everything into your data lake, if you don't actually get to processing, it becomes uh, less valuable and less important. Uh, so one of the things is making sure that data is high quality, it's structured in a way that you can access, it's put into a catalog that you can review and get to very quickly and understand uh, from an analyst perspective what you're actually looking at and being able to actually put that data to use. So one of the hopes is today we can talk about uh, how AMP is doing that. I talked a little bit about this before, but just to give you an idea, these are all the different compliance regimes uh, that we take care of uh, all of our infrastructure and making sure that they're dealt with so that our customers don't need to. Uh, in addition to those, we've got uh, all of the new ones that we've been focusing a lot of energy on making sure that we're up to compliance on, uh, such as GDPR, uh, such as the most recent CCPA, uh, PCI DSS, of course, and others that are unique to the financial services organizations. Finally, uh, when we talk about AWS, we, we need to make sure that we uh, explain this to our customers. We have something called the shared responsibility model. Underneath the line from compute, storage, database networking are hypervisors that we support to allow customers to put whatever technologies they may want to put on top of that compute or storage. Uh, we take care of everything of the cloud. So if it's our responsibility to ensure the security of the cloud, but whatever data technologies uh, compute systems, et cetera, you put into the cloud need to be things that you're responsible for. And so uh, that's an important opportunity to choose the best technologies to put in. And so I think it's important that we, we show off some of the best technologies such as Talon in, in today's webinar. So with that, I want to hand it off to Nick Piet to go over what Talon does on top of AWS. Yep. Thank you, Ryan. So today I'd like to talk to you about how you can share your data lake project is going to be successful. Now, for those of you who don't know who Talent is, we are a data integration company that specializes in helping organizations like yourselves further their digital transformation initiatives and really through collaborative data management tools. Now, over the last couple of years, we've been working with the majority of our 1,500 customers as well as our wider open source community on projects just like this. How can we make data lakes successful? So what I'd like to do is spend a couple minutes talking about some of that shared collective wisdom that we've been able to collect that we feel is important for customers who are attempting a data lake project. Now, not to give away the ending, because Karen and the team at AMP are gonna go through some really great stuff, um, but <clears throat> we tend to find a lot of commonalities in the research that we've done that stems from a number of issues. One of the more larger issues continues to kind of boil to the top, tends to be around the lack of governance, lineage, really ultimately a lack of quality within a data lake. Now, how we do this, right, is essentially 
if we look at it, it's not an easy topic to discuss, right? And I appreciate you guys taking the time to join us today. You know, this one widely stems from either ideologies that have existed in previous examples or potentially legacy technologies that really impacted the adoption of governance within a data lake. You know, oftentimes it's difficult to establish a balance between accessibility of the data and as well as then in a way that's governed and controlled. And so what we'd like to do is we've, we've looked at two models that a number of our customers attempt to try to implement when they start out on a big data project and, and really looking at benefits of each one and really some of the negatives to, to really kind of set up for four real, you know, valid proof points for how organizations can kind of try to put governance into their data lake. So a more traditional approach that we've seen is kind of what we've done traditionally with data warehousing in the past. You know, the Encyclop Encyclopedia Britannica or Microsoft Encarta version, if you will, I think I still have some of those CDs sitting around, you know, where the idea was is that you had a handful of experts that were really allowed to author data within your organization. They collaborated with a number of different types of contributors, but ultimately data for its purpose of existence within an organization really didn't have that, that quantifiable existence until one of these collaborators of these uh, had gone through and worked with these editors to really proof this out. Now challenges with this is that we relied on really ex experienced data professionals and they were armed with methodologies for best practices on how to designing warehouses, creating the data mart so that it could fit the various business domains. You know, only then when we'd put that semantic layer on top of everything that was built, could we really start consuming this data. This kind of goes contrary to the whole point of having a data lake, but it was done in a way that essentially ensured that the quality of data and rather the access that organizations had to that data um, didn't trip them up or wasn't suspect when it came time to actually driving analytics from it. But as we've been talking about, I mean, when we look at the, the volume and variety of data that is coming into our organization these days, an approach like this, while beneficial because we had a, a you know, data in order to exist within the organization had to be cataloged, we could understand the lineage, just the speed and, and volume that we're having to deal with these days does not allow this traditional approach to be implemented full stop. If we look at it as kind of uh, what we've seen and, and proved it out, again, when we started looking at some of this Gartner research and others, is a majority of you who are in the process today of trying to even manage this process spend more time having to deal with data quality, data governance, or even metadata management issues than you would traditionally integrating this data and making it available within the organization, right? When we've looked at research, it's showing that nearly 50%, as this kind of graph showed, right, spent more on that traditional process, which was beneficial because organizations knew what existed, but was detrimental when we started looking at probably with the JIRA tickets many of us are dealing with around, give me access to X or give me access to B, right, different types of data. When big data and, and larger projects kind of came in, um, one of the things that we, we started to run into though was a, a transition from a more governed and controlled approach to one that, that benefited from accessibility. And the idea was is that sure, we've got all of this raw data coming from a variety of different applications, whether it was IoT data, whether it was social media data, whether it was just new data sources from our trading partners. But where we kind of lost the way was that we, we no longer had full visibility or the lineage of this information, which was important for us as we were starting to make critical decisions on this. So if you look at it, you would probably have a traditional data scientist start the exploration phase. They kind of would start looking at it, identifying what was going on, uh, and then start kind of actually processing it. They put some level of governance in place before the business analyst team had access and this kind of repetition of how data continued to become more accessible within the organization started to occur. Now, this, this model definitely has a number of advantages over the previous. It scales across data sources, um, the use cases, the audiences that you're trying to work with. Raw data can be ingested as it comes in, right, with minimal upfront implementation costs. The changes were somewhat upfront and straightforward to implement, um, but the challenge with this, and often what we see with customers that were implementing a big data uh, data lake as part of this, is that 
data governance and, and really understanding the lineage of this data became an afterthought, something that they would attempt to do after the fact. And it's one of those situations, as we all know, when we start building this data lake, I mean, the volume that we're talking about handling, it comes to a point that going back and trying to reestablish quality and control routines to, to ensure that this data lake does not become a swamp is just an unsurmountable uh, practice once you've gotten to you know the size that we're all dealing with. Trying to restart that whole process, ultimately we saw organizations that, that tried to do this had more often or not created a data swamp, right? So we've kind of talked about some of the benefits in each one of these cases, right? When we look at the traditional approach, really having access um, to experts, to understanding the, the, the type of information that's going in, whereas when we look at it from the accessibility perspective, ensuring that the various business units could access data in a timely manner in the format that they needed, there is a way to essentially kind of create both. A governance has to be something that is established as you start to build the data lake. And when we've worked with our customers, you know, it's basically come into kind of four concrete rules. So the first piece of this is that when we start loading data into a data lake, in order to provide a good data governance, we need to start the discovery upfront. Right? Understanding the diverse data sources that are within your data landscape is critical to understanding how you can then automate the inventory and really allow a inverse to what we saw with the Encyclopedia Britannica approach or that kind of, I had a few experts and they helped with collaborators, but really start crowdsourcing this information, taking more of a Wikipedia approach. You know, essentially, understanding that individuals that are bringing data within the organization are starting to fill the data lake have responsibility to empower the data stewards with a basic understanding of what is being brought in. If I don't understand how Facebook data is going to help me, uh, imagine the potential of, of exposing that within the organization, especially when we start seeing more privacy laws be invoked through GDPR. Right, it talks about the need to establish those data quality rules up front. We've, we've talked about the need of having that lineage for new data sources, and, and really what we tend to see is that by creating those trusted assets um, and the insights that can be derived, organizations feel more comfortable with the data. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that all organizations can implement that as part of their process. A lot of data is still more real-time. Collecting that information is as critical as exposing it. And so what we see is for many organizations to ensure the quality or consistency of the data within the data lake might create what they call a data swamp or a murky lake as more of a staging area. Right? It's, it's critical for organizations to recognize that once data exists within a, a defined lake, right, that access and, and that control is something that anyone through the organization with access should be able to consume. Now, we've seen a number of different implementations from a you know, best practices perspective. I'd say if you guys are looking for some additional learning, we've done some great work around data vault methodologies and how structured data lakes and trusted data lakes can be built using those types of uh, methodologies. Uh, it's something that I would consider reading up on as ways of ensuring that the data that you're putting in your data lake can be of that consistent quality. Now, we did just kind of touch on some of those uh, regulations, and Ryan put a, a good list of those that were coming up before. But being able to protect the data and really ensure that only those that are authorized, um, you need to create that compliance as part of your data lake. Right? Using policy-based governance controls with the lineage upstream from the source and then all the way downstream to the final consumer is what creates that single point of control. And what we see with many within the or, uh, many customers of ours that are trying to implement this is that that's really how you start securely managing this data lake. Have to have full lineage from source to downstream. Now, we've been talking mainly around the governance and, and quality of this, but there's access uh, controls that we need to start putting in place as well, right? We need to do this in such a way that actually supports more of a self-service model, right? So essentially, I can provide autonomy to the data access, I can use, uh, but only to the authorized parties, and this would allow us to really just drive those insights potentially to any user, because ultimately that's kind of what is driving these data lake projects. I need to derive that insight. Now, as long as data is properly documented, and it's, it, 
you know, it's easy to understand, I can trust the lineage, then the insight that I derive from it is equally as um, beneficial to the organization. If I have no idea what type of data I'm looking at and I put it through a machine learning algorithm that's helping classify potential users and maybe their buying habits, how can I trust that decision that was made if I don't understand the data? This is why we're talking about a comprehensive need for data governance. Now, once I have this data, I need to start exposing it within the organization. You know, we start looking at different ways of helping provide that accessibility at scale. And what we've seen a number of organizations do is start making data a service for the people and applications that exist within their organization. So it's not just providing governance and control of, the ac of where data is coming from and who can access it, but doing it in such a way that ensures from an analytical perspective, I have access, but certainly from an experience perspective, I have it too. So using good APIs to expose this data. Oop, jumped one too many. So we've talked a lot about some of the methodologies or ideologies that are impacting the way that we actually control data. When we look at it from a technology perspective, we also kind of, you probably are sitting there saying, Nick, how can I implement these types of controls and, and exposure of data throughout my pipeline as I'm processing it? And, and rightly so, traditional approaches tended to decouple their integration from their data quality needs, uh, which meant it was very difficult to implement those and really forced you to do that after the fact. But when we look at what Talon's architecture has done, is essentially we enable the ability to Im embed those quality and governance routines up front in, is part of the ingestion process and really manage and curate all of this throughout the entire life cycle of data within this data lake. Uh, whether you're sitting there on Hadoop or a cloud-based transient cluster, data quality can be applied up front, right, before your, your lake has turned into a data swamp. Now, one of the things that I also like to kind of mention here is because we are, uh, when we're building this, we have a graphical interface to deploy this, it's code native. Or, so essentially, when I'm trying to run data in my data lake on AWS, I can utilize Talon and run it as natively as possible without having to incur additional economics with regards to runtimes. So it's done in such a way that it's actually economically feasible for me to discover, catalog, organize, and expose that data within the organization. So we've talked a lot about how and why we need to apply some of these ideologies as part of building our data lake. I'd like to spend some time now handing this over to Karen to talk about actually how you could do that. So Karen? Great, thanks Nick. Um, yes, um, totally. We're, we're, we're going to um, roll our sleeves up here and get down and talk about how we have applied those principles at AMP. So hi everybody, my name is Karen Halligan and I head up information management at AMP. And we do all the traditional things. We have a data council. Uh, we have data stewards. Uh, in fact, we meet with our data stewards 8.30 every Tuesday morning. And our um, session this week was on data literacy. Um, but I'm, I'm very much a pragmatic person. In fact, I was talking to Gartner yesterday about how so many CDOs fail. Um, and I think part of that is failing to bring the theory into the practical. And so that's what we want to talk about um, this morning, how at AMP we've um, applied all this theory. Um, but before I do, let me tell you a little bit about AMP and who we are. So um, we, we're an old company. We've been around for about 170 years almost. And um, we're a financial services company. Um, we everything we do and our catchphrase is all about helping people own tomorrow. Um, we've got um, quite diverse um, businesses, but uh, one of our businesses is the financial advisors. We've got the largest financial advice network in Australia. We also um, are the biggest superannuation company. Now, um, not everyone will probably know what superannuation is, but the Australian government brought it in here as a mandatory kind of retirement savings plan. Um, gosh, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Um, and um, that's where um, I think it's, it's being brought in actually in some of the Asian countries as well. 
Um, we also uh, have an insurance company. We do a lot of insurance inside Super, actually, and we have a small but emerging bank. And our capital business has like three large businesses in it. One of those is um, real estate. We do a lot of investment in real estate. Um, infrastructure, you know, we own airports and things like that. And um, of course, investment markets. Uh, so that's a little bit about, uh, I guess, AMP. Um, we um, just progressing the slide here. Yeah. So um, with, with with all of this wonderful history and diversity uh, comes some challenges. So we've got a history of mergers and acquisitions. We've got lots of systems. Um, we call them puzzles, product admin systems, and we've got over 50 of them. And, and therefore, we have uh, quite a lot of data quality challenges, as you would imagine. Um, I just went too far, far there. Okay. Uh, so, we're living in an unprecedented um, phase of scrutiny by our uh, regulators at the moment. Um, and um, it, it really is um, extraordinary, the level of um, reg regulation, uh, the new laws that are coming at us, and the need to have trust in our data is um, exponentially growing. And um, I think the business is uh, struggling or, um, in some cases to find the owners who are willing to sign off on data sets that are leaving the organization. So um, what we're going to do is talk about a particular use case where we worked with a business unit, it's actually for our insurance business, um, to help them gain trust in a data set that they needed um, to be um, aggregated and shared um, externally. So this was actually for our reinsurance um, uh, part of the insurance business. So um, um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with reinsurance where it allows you to free up capital and um, you um, reinsure, I guess, your risk. Um, and when you do reinsurance, the reinsurers want to know a lot of information about your policies, your uh, claims, and claims payments. So we, when when that those data sets were brought together in our Down and Lake, um, we actually had five different product systems, and um, more than fifty critical data elements that needed to be uh, pulled together and um, over 100 data quality metrics that we're now computing daily um, and reporting to the business to um, help them get that trust. So we'll um, explain a little bit about um, how we've used um, challenge uh, to help us with that piece. Um, so the technology stack we're using includes the Talent product suite, which consists of data quality, data integration, and metadata management tools. AWS services are used extensively to manage data in our data lake. Um, EMR and Athena provide us with scaled out parallel processing of our data lake. Um, our data lake is in Amazon Cloud, and it is fed source data using Talon data integration from our on-prem data product system that I told you about earlier. Other major components include Talon Metadata Manager and the Data Quality Dashboard. This is a more detailed view of the um, architecture. It shows the AWS components and services that we use in our data lake. S3 for storage, EMR for processing, Amazon RDS for DQ metrics, AWS Athena for data querying and technical metadata. 
we use AWS EC2 to host our talent product. And um, our data lake is in the virtual private cloud. So now we get into um, how we bring together those technologies and I guess the more um, you know, traditional information management capabilities. So our, um, this, this uh, slide shows a logical view where we have layers shown in that pyramid. Um, the lake layer is really our landing area where raw data from the source system lands. And then it goes into our mirror layer, which is a full reconcilable reflection of all of those source systems. And then we have an object layer, and this is where we have subject area by system. So we will have one of our paths is called ABLE, and so we'll have claims, um, ABLE claims in that um, um, layer. And then our single source of truth is our enterprise subject area for claims. So that brings together claims from all of the different paths. And then our MVOT, which is multiple versions of truth, is the use case specific um, objects. And that's where we pull together the information that the reinsurer needs and we make it available um, to them through that layer. Um, so, uh, so the slide I just went through really quickly. So the data quality management, this is just um, showing you a picture of what a profile um, looks like. Obviously, we uh, profile our data as it comes through the integration layer. We make this available to business and IT um, users of the data. And then we have our um, um, DQ dashboards and our reconciliation and DQ rules. So it's very important that um, when we think of uh, data quality management, uh, people often think of it in a point in time, and we're really trying to make that paradigm shift with our business users to consider um, that data quality, you know, it changes every day, it comes and goes, and the DQ issues you might have today will uh, differ to the ones you'll have tomorrow. So you need to constantly uh, monitor it. These dashboards are actively being used now by both the technical teams and the business teams. And um, they are, we have uh, worked with the business users to define all these data quality rules and tolerances. And um, they continue to um, refine and adjust those rules over time. So um, governance really does start with ownership. Meeting AMP's uh, information management policy and framework principles by ensuring that all the data um, is owned, governed, and managed. And that's how we believe you can get the most value out of your data. Clearly defined ownership is key um, to ensure data assets are understood, maintained, and to continue to provide value. Um, so the data lake um, data sets and the transformations that drive data sets are the primary assets, in particular those maintained at the object single source of truth layer, as they provide the greatest opportunity for data sharing and reuse. Um, ownership also extends to the features we apply, we apply to document our data and to maintain the desired level of data quality. You know, we we um, um, have um, the business glossary populated um, using um, uh, working with our data stewards. We've been able to populate our business uh, glossary, and that has been um, done using. I guess we um, use the Accord to kind of get started, and then we adjust it with our stewards to ensure that we've got uh, AMP's kind of definitions in there. We link the um, business glossary to the technical metadata. And that's something that our business users have found uh, tremendously valuable. 
Um, we we have uh, our, our subject matter experts are thin on the ground, and they are constantly bombarded with the same questions every project uh, around the same data sets. And that ability for them to say, you know, you can just go to the business glossary and look it up yourself is um, really powerful. We're investing in that, um, but we see that the value in that in the longer term is um, is really going to um, take the pressure off those SMEs. Okay, so um, in this slide, we're sh there's actually a picture to the right there that actually shows the graphical view of um, how we can uh, look at lineage. Lineage is really um, important for, for our business users to be able to understand both the semantic view, but also to be able to look at business impacts if there is a data quality issue. Um, and that's um, also stipulated, we've got a regulation here called CPG 235, and our regulator has has said and was mentioned earlier actually that you know having that full lineage from the source system through to the report is um, it's just mandatory now and um, and to be able to present it to the business in a graphical way um, really is quite helpful um, so this slide um, capturing the metadata um, and being able to harvest it from all of those source systems, link it to the uh, business metadata, and link it then to our um, data assets um, has been, um, it's been a very um, fruitful exercise for us. We've, as we say, we've, we've really done it for three critical data sets policies, claims, and claims payments. We, and that's just in our insurance business, with a diverse business like we've got, um, we think we've got about 130 critical data sets that we would like um, to have that same level of lineage, reconciliation, and data quality dashboards. So it, it, is, a, it is a large um, task. Um, what we've been able to do is uh, work with our architecture community and have um, our metadata tool, TMM, um, approved by the architecture community so that all new projects now going forward uh, will, uh, will consider their metadata requirements and build them in this way. Um, so the the retrofit of that across our legacy is something that we'll tackle, you know, separately, and um, we may have to take a pragmatic approach there. That's what we do um, and don't do. Um, so the results uh, for the insurance business at the moment: um, um, 10 billion rows of data processed in under an hour. This runs every day. We have critical reports that give the business confidence in the data that's going through to the reinsurer. We have quality dashboards that um, that allow them to monitor and manage the quality, not just going to reinsurance, but generally in their business. We've introduced um, reporting zones. And reporting zones are A, B, and C, and reporting zone A is where, um, where information management capabilities are mandatory. And reporting zone B is where they're optional. And then reporting zone C is really more self-service, uh, what if scenarios, uh, that kind of thing, where you wouldn't really uh, bother applying um, information management, lineage, reconciliation, et cetera, across them. So what we will be doing is mandating anything that sits in that reporting zone A will need to have these, um, these necessary um, information management components. The business glossary, we've got a vision for the business glossary to be in the hands of everybody. Um, at the moment, we're building it up business unit by business unit. Um, I think when the business see it linked to the technical um, 
uh, metadata and then they can see their lineage, it really it gives it another level of power for them. Um, at the end of the day, we've been able to give our uh, insurance business confidence in the data that they're getting um, through the data lake. So although this was built for a use case, um, we actually have built it in such a way that it can be um, extended and used uh, for any um, data requirements that insurance will have um, over um, claims, claims payments and insurance policy. So, um, <clears throat> so I hope that uh, anyone listening gets a feel for how you can take, I guess, this theory and apply it practically in a data lake environment. I'd like to say thanks to AWSM Talon uh, for inviting us to speak at this webinar, but also for helping us gain that trust in our data lake. Karen, uh, thank you very much for that. And thank you uh, for, for presenting today. Uh, I have to tell you that I think I personally got a lot of value in understanding your thoughts around data ownership. I think that that's a key issue that we see a lot of customers not think about uh, early enough. Uh, and I think it's especially becoming an issue in more regulated and sensitive uh, regions. So I think that's, a, that's something to look into. Uh, I think the, um, the second piece about data quality is something that we even got a question about. Uh, so what I'd like to do is maybe step into that, that Q&A portion of the conversation at this point. Uh, and then we'll, we may close up here. We, we talked about these things. Um, so let's go into the Q&A, especially around that data quality question. One of the uh, people on the call, Abdul, asked the question, uh, what is your follow-up process when you determine that there's a, a quality issue uh, in your data? Yeah, sure. So we actually had to work with the um, insurance team and we, we did an operating model. And we sent, um, uh, once we had defined these are your core data elements, and then we had defined not just the profiling, because that was kind of fairly standard, we didn't need requirements from them on that. Then we, but then we had targeted DQ rules that we um, workshopped with them. And then once we got the dashboards running, um, there was a lot of discussion as to who's going to monitor the dashboards and what are we going to do when the quality doesn't meet um, the needs um, um, of the business. And that's where uh, we had this operating model um, established. And we now have a uh, remediation process as well where we can um, uh, funnel records so, so our data quality dashboard, you can actually extract records with enough input they're actionable. That was a key requirement where you can actually log into one of the puzzles and fix the data if that's what's required. So that's part of a remediation process, which we have a lot of our admin teams are all over the world. They're outsourced. Um, and so in some cases, um, we just uh, uh, load the data into our um, BP, BPS tool and send it off to those teams to fix the data. I have a great way to handle it. I think it's so, so important to have a circular process for quality uh, that you have to keep kind of uh, refreshing and going through it to have a dashboard is a good way to handle that. Um, another question to ask, and um, Karen or Nick, I'm not sure which who would best answer this, but um, what is the recommended tools uh, to build out the metadata, or or what tools uh, did you specifically use, Karen? So we're using Talent Metadata Manager for the, um, which is TMM for the um, metadata component, and that's got that nice graphical um, semantic uh, lineage view that the business likes, um, and it, it it ingests the technical metadata, um, harvests it. Yeah. Uh, perfect. <clears throat> um, John asked the question, does each data element or attribute have a reporting zone assigned? Sure we oh, look, we, haven't, we haven't done that at the data element level at this stage. Um, the reporting zones are more um, conceptual at this stage and just coming in, and they tend to be for the whole report. 
but it's something to consider actually that 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 actually um um I might just write that one down and have a think about that. It could be a good way of doing it. Yeah. Um, G is asking the question, are you using HDFS as a file system uh, or something else to store those 10 billion rows? If Satish is on the line, he, he might be able to answer that one for me. Uh, yes, sorry, I'm on the line. Uh, we use S3, yeah. All of our data lake storage is Amazon S3. Uh, perfect. Um, Arun asked the question, did you use any data models for your data lake to capture the results? I'll take it. Uh, the data modeling is fundamental, right? Any data lake or data warehouse, data model represents the view of the data that we need to get. So without data model, there is no data reports. S3 is, as you know, it's an uh, object storage. Uh, so that's the reason we use Athena. Athena provides you a uh, database like uh, uh, view of your files. And then, yes, data model is extensively used to model our data, to create reports and uh, the consumption. For consumption, we need data model. And today we use primarily Athena as our uh, way to query the data. And then uh, we use uh, EMR Spark uh, also to process the data and export the data out. So um, I, I have a follow-up question to that. So both Miguel and John have asked the question to, if you could tell us about the way that you store the data, what formats do you use when you store it in S3, and kind of what does that data structure look like? Okay, technically, yes. Um, uh, to, for the performance reason, we store everything as in ORC file. ORC file is a, as you know, is a columnar format. Columnar format format gives us a uh, you know, higher performance, and uh, uh, and for all our analytical use case and data quality metrics is kind of an analytic use case, and it allows us uh, to process uh, you know, data extremely uh, fast and in a high performance way. So ORC file is our uh, default storage for all the uh, layers in the data lake. The ingestion layer where the raw data lands will be either in CSV or in JSON format. Then we process them into ORC file format going forward. Very interesting. Okay. Um, uh, Seth asked the question, what was the level of completeness of your data quality rules? Uh, how many false negatives? I mean, accuracy of your rules, false positives were you able to achieve? Yeah, there was um, a um, a level of filtering that had to occur. So we did it in kind of rounds. We found that there was a lot of um, archived claims that were coming through on the DQ um, reports initially. So we had to filter those out. Um, so it took two or three rounds of um, mm -hmm. reviewing the the false negatives. Um, and really honing in on, on what, what the business wanted to see in their DQ dashboard. Oh, that's great. Um, James is asking a follow-up question to the ORC file. Uh, he wants to know if you're using compression, whether it's snappy, gzip, or if you're just leaving it uncompressed. Uh, we do compress. Uh, I think we use snappy compression, but it's not an, a deterministic factor. Uh, it's based on uh, the storage and the requirement and thing. Most uh, of our default processing uses snappy compression. Yeah. Um, follow uh, Abdul is asking if you could uh, describe the modules of talent you ended up using in the end. Can I take it? Um, or our, uh, okay, so this is Satish. Uh, we use uh, DQ components in the talent, talent product suite. Uh, you know, the profiling components and uh, some of the DQ components like pattern matching and those things. And primary, the most of the things are integrated in data integration jobs, talent data integration jobs. And then at the top of it, we use talent metadata manager uh, for the all our metadata management uh, uh, needs. 
Uh, if there's anything else specifically. Um, Jennifer's asking how you sized your Spark cluster for all the varying data volumes. Uh, was it manual or did you use some sort of automation process to do that? Our entire infrastructure is fully automated, that is scripted. There is no human intervention. So the engineering team uh, does the work based on the data size and volume, and it's completely scripted uh, cloud formation, AWS scripts, and all those things. So that's a pr one of the primary uh, operating model in our in the, the adoption of cloud is that it should be completely scripted. There is no human intervention. So the sizing and everything is pre-scripted. And because as you can see, we run this every day in an automated fashion. There is no, uh, nobody starting the cluster, running the cluster. So it's all pre-scripted, runs automatically every day, publishes the metrics. Uh, so yes, it's, it's sized and uh, runs completely automated. We don't do uh, dynamic sizing. Uh, it's more like predefined sizing. Yeah. I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but um, as I do, I'm going to leave this up on the screen so people can get the links. Um, I'll ask our organizer to also post it into the chat so people can uh, click the links. Um, and uh, John asked the question, can we get a copy of this presentation after uh, and that will be available uh, in your email uh, within a couple of days after the, uh, the finish of the webinar. Um, I'll take a couple more questions from the list here. Uh, Alan asked the question, uh, could you possibly use this type of data lake for other content systems like EIA or ECM? Uh, you know, can you or are you enriching archive data with the additional metadata from the lake? Uh, Nick, that might be a good question for you. Yep, though you cut out a little bit towards the end. Could you say that one more time? What? Yes, yeah, so it's like, uh, can you use these types of data lakes for other content systems like EIA and ECM? Uh, can you enrich the archive data um, using additional metadata from the data lake? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> if we look at, you know, ultimately using data lakes to collect that information, drive insight, uh, finding ways of discovering that metadata, even in archived files, uh, means that more insight for the organization can be there. I mean, when we see customers talk about you know half of the data that they're trying to make accessible with the organization, it just isn't yet. And so when you start looking at, at ways of crawling through um, the various archived files, uh, new insights can definitely be derived from that. And, and ultimately, I think as part of that, there's there's some level of not being a pack rat versus you know <laughs> what, um, what can drive it. It comes back to that ownership as we were talking about. I, I would not suggest bringing new data into an organization without some level of data owner even in archived files. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, Yasin is asking the question, uh, which AWS tools are you using in addition uh, to, for data governance in the data environment, or, or any other tools for that matter that you're using for data governance? Uh, for data governance, uh, I think it's it's more like as we talked about uh, it's not more. It's not about technology here. It's more about your uh, operating model and the uh, uh, I would say a culture, data culture. You know, the we I am COE. Karen can explain that as explained before that we have an every Tuesday there is a uh, meeting with all the data stewards and data owners and we discuss the issues and catalog them, work with them, and then it's more about. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's all about your data culture. Uh, having that in the organization is key for success of data governance. All right. Um, Abdul, that's a question. Uh, were all your data sources already? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I okay. guess I just want um, to add to that. Um, we, we don't have, to have like a Calibra or anything like that. We've um, we've um, kind of tried to go um, more native tools um, and using our internal intranet and um, things like that to, to um, make those um, aspects available to uh, the business, hiding the tools if you like. But we do have like IBM's master data management system for our customer master. And, um, you know, we've got reference data tools as well. But um, yeah, 
no, nothing for specific other than TMM for the stewards. Perfect. Yeah, there's a lot of really great data governance tools in various categories out, uh, both the AWS offer um, as well as uh, our partners offer, uh, including some additional ones in Talent Hub. So, um, Abdul is asking the question Were all your data sources already within AWS, or are you receiving other external data sources? Okay, I'll take it. Uh, as you can see in the diagram we showed before, we ingest data from our on-prem as well as cloud system into the data lake. So it's not everything is in cloud. We have, obviously, we have data uh, many places. Uh, Raphael is asking a question. Uh, could you give us an idea of how long it's taking for your EMR clusters uh, to get spun up and start initializing? Uh, it's 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 not a significant factor. It's like in minutes. Like we don't have a massive EMR cluster. We don't have like hundred nodes kind of things. Most of our EMR cluster, uh, it's uh, within that ten node uh, area. So it doesn't take uh, much significant time to be noted. Perfect. Uh, Arun is asking a question. Uh, why use uh, Athena versus Redshift, and it sounded like you're using Athena direct to directly access the data, uh, as opposed to importing into Redshift. Uh, I think you like you understand that the, the difference between Athena and Redshift is uh, uh, we have all our data in S3. We don't want to move the data because the data like uh, thing is that we don't want to move the data to another layer. Uh, Redshift player. Redshift manages the data, so we have to copy the data from S3 into the Redshift. What Athena allows us is that we can do the data quality check and the reconciliation on the S3 directly, so we're not moving the data. The, the issues with moving the data means we have to reconcile that again, how we move it correctly. By using Athena, I'm doing it in situ, that is, we are processing data as it is there instead of moving. And, and I'll add in for customers who are using and have big Redshift environments, uh, one thing you may want to look at is Redshift Spectrum, uh, so you can access that data within the S3 environment and tie it into your Redshift environment. Uh, but I, I agree with you that, that the easiest answer in many cases is just to access it by Athena. Um, I think some of these are asking for some screenshots and things. Uh, oh. Um, Uh, are you using any data encryption methodologies? All our data that is stored in S3 is encrypted using server-side encryption. Uh, that's our default uh, uh, policies for storing any data in AWS. All will be uh, encrypted uh, using server-side encryption. Okay, and then uh, we don't have the ability to show this, but I know Miguel's asked it a few times and he's wanting to get an idea of, of how that structure looks like within S3. Uh, I think that might take um, I might take a picture, but uh, if you want to maybe describe that a little bit more detail, um, people are really, really wondering to know more about how you break out your structures within your buckets. Is there a, uh, was there a methodology you used to ultimately create that, that breakout? I think that uh, we do have an uh, uh, architecture or a you know, strategy. Uh, how do we store the data, the partitioning, the formatting, all those things. So that's been agreed with our architecture team and development team uh, as a way to how do we ingest data, how do we store it, how do we partition it, how do we archive it. So it's 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 uh, whatever we agreed uh, across the teams. Uh, so that's why we did. So not nothing special on it. It's just that. Uh, we have a particular format. For example, we identify system, you know, date, time, ingestion time, and the subject area or table name as the uh, structure. And then we ingest there. That way allows us to do, uh, you know, it naturally allows us partitioning. That improves the performance a lot uh, when you are querying on particular uh, time range. Well, thank you for that. I want to, I'm, uh, with, with that in mind, and we've hit the top of the hour, I really appreciate uh, the, the panelists and the team that have been here to answer the questions and to speak today. I also want to really thank our audience for attending. 
I uh, really appreciate everything you do uh, and everything you, you, you do with AWS. Uh, we look forward to following up after this. Uh, reminder, there's going to be a, a post uh, survey, uh, satisfaction survey for the webinar. Please fill that out. Uh, thank you again for attending and have a wonderful rest of your day.